Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, it's a Spanish lesson for England. They're beaten 2-1 in their Wembley homecoming in the UEFA Nations League. West Ham defender Declan Rice, he's a wanted man. England are trying to lure him away from the Republic of Ireland. And the Hammers, though, they need him on top form in the Premier League next weekend. Manuel Pellegrini is going in search of his first win in the top flight at Everton. On the winning team today, Martin Samuel, he's the chief sports writer at the Daily Mail. Darren Lewis is a football reporter with The Mirror. And Sid Lowe, he's making his debut. He's a football writer with The Guardian. He's based in Spain. Buenos dias. Como estas? Very well, thanks. How are you? Oh, I thought you were going to talk to me in Spanish. Oh, I, was, I thought we could do the oh, show in Spanish today. we do the whole today. thing in Spanish? That, That'd be brilliant, yeah, we yeah. Can do. Yeah. Happy with Spanish? Yeah. No, see. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do the show in English. Don't forget, you can uh, tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on the screen over the next 90 minutes. Let's have a look at the papers then, all reflecting on last night's defeat for England. Kane's fury, he accuses the referee of bottling at Danny Welbeck's equaliser ruled out in the final seconds of that game, that 2-1 defeat at Wembley Stadium last night. The Sunday Times have got a different view, a different verdict, though. They say this is a bumpy landing for England. That's three defeats on the spin for Gareth Southgate's side. World Cup semi-final, of course, the third and fourth place playoff with Belgium and that game against Spain last night. Uh, better news, though, for this man, Luke Shaw, carried off last night at Wembley Stadium. He, has, he is, though, Tweeting, he does say he'll make a full recovery, a speedy recovery, which is good news for the Manchester United and England left back. Um, that is also that story on the back page as well of the, the Express this morning. Also, John Terry here. This is across most of the newspapers. John Terry about to sign, remarkably, for Spartak Moscow. He is, of course, a free agent after leaving Aston Villa at the end of last season. He was in an interview in the Daily Mail on Saturday saying he did have options. One of them appears to be Spartak Moscow. Um, the mirror, Shaw's agony, which we've just talked about. Zinedine Zidane, though. John Richardson saying Zidane compiling his wish list of Manchester United targets. If he succeeds, Jose Mourinho. Mourinho was at the game last night at Wembley Stadium, watching one or two of his United players, David De Gea, of course, in goal for Spain. Uh, Luke Shaw at left back. Sam Wallace's column this morning. We're going to get onto this in part two. Interesting story this. Declan Rice. This is Sam's column this morning. Uh, why it's wrong to pillory Declan Rice just for keeping his options open. He has, of course, played senior football with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, but in, he can, he does qualify to play for England. Uh, the Mail on Sunday, though, they've got a different idea on the back page this morning. The wrong one, Pep is the right man for Manchester United, uh, not Jose. Uh, that's the Manchester United legend um, and former France international Eric Cantona are talking this morning in the Mail on Sunday. But uh, we'll talk England-Spain mm -hmm. last night at Wembley Stadium, Martin. Um, what did we learn from the game? Mm. Well, we found another team that we're not quite as good at football as. Um, we're finding a lot of them lately. Yeah. Um, and we keep learning these lessons um, that we learn by losing to Belgium and then we lose to Croatia, we've learned a lesson there, and then we lose to Spain and we've learned a lesson there. We're going to be the best educated team in Europe. Um, the problem we have is that sooner or later, that momentum that we thought we had um, from the World Cup in the summer, when we, the, the, these, these small victories of winning a penalty shootout and, and, and having a, a young team that, that, that everyone believed in, reaching a World Cup semi-final, which was absolutely fantastic. You would hope from that there is a momentum going forward. But now the fog has cleared, England are... They're playing... They're trying to play better football. The, the problem's not that fella there, for starters. I mean, he, 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 you know, it's certainly not him. Everything he's doing, all of his instincts, are, are the right instincts. Unfortunately, if you keep losing matches, it's very hard to... It, it's very hard to develop if you if you keep losing matches. Sooner or later, you've got to have a you've got to have an end product. And England keep getting beat by by every good team they play, which is where they've always been. It's, it's where England have always been. That's, you know? I mean, that, that's one of the things that I think sometimes gets overlooked, is that England's World Cup record is incredibly consistent. Yeah. It is basically the same at almost lose every World Cup. Good team you exactly. Play. You come out of the group, and then you, lose, you beat the teams that are ranked lower than you, and you mm. lose to the first team that's ranked above you. Mm. And obviously, that means in 1990, it's a fantastic World Cup because you get to the semi-final, having gone through Belgium and having gone through Cameroon. Mm. This time round, it's a fantastic World Cup when you get to the semi-final. But it's partly about, and this is a a little bit oversimplistic, but it's partly about at which point did you face the team that was ranked higher than you? Yeah. If it's the first one after the group stage, it appears to be a poor World Cup. If you manage through <laughs> through the beauty of the draw to get through a couple of stages, it looks better. But the, 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 the fundamental place England are in 
hasn't actually changed exactly enormously. Changed. That's right. I think the sensations are different, though. And I think Southgate was, was very, very good last night in the flash zone after the game. And, you know, when he was asked about what this says about the World Cup, what this says about England's position, he said, well, look, I was already realistic that even the summer didn't he always necessarily... Was. And, and, he always and was. the summer didn't allow him or didn't it force him to, to kind of break from, from that clear vision of, of what it is he thinks he's got and where it is he wants to take England. Obviously, you've got to convince others. That's the other thing. It's not just about him. Mm. He, wasn't, he didn't try to convince anyone in midweek in the many no. press uh, conferences that he gave um, that England were any better than they are at the moment. Um, he was very realistic. He talked about our record against the top teams being non-existent. Um, and he, he said, look, we're on a journey and we're trying to get to the level that Spain are at. And that's what we saw last night. So in some regard, it was a reality, a lot of regard, it was a, a reality check. But I think the fact that he wants to persist with this way of playing, and you look at the build-up, for example, for Rashford's goal, started with uh, England playing out of the press, mm. sweeping the ball, wonderful passage of play, which obviously ended up with Luke Shaw setting up uh, Rashford. And you, you can see signs that, in patches, England can adapt to that way of playing, but obviously Spain are several levels above us, and they're tweaking a, a well-oiled machine. You know that we are nowhere near that level yet, and I think for that reason, we should. We also have the difference between now and 1990 is that we got the continuity of having a manager who continues yes. in the job. Yeah. And it's very rare that we have managers who continue in the job after uh, major tournaments, but um, I think as far as uh, Southgate is concerned, he is building, there is a continuity within the setup, and I think through the fog, the, 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 maybe reasons to be slightly positive about the future. Well, why, Martin, are countries, for example, Spain, several levels above technically? Because you made the point about that they are, that they are and I don't think anyone disagrees with that, we could go back to their performance at the World Cup where they lost, of course, against Russia in the first knockout mm. round. OK, we know that they but changed the match. Yeah, yeah, OK. For Spain, I know, wasn't I know, it? I mean, I they know, lost the they manager. Did, it was a strange thing. Are, they did go out. Yeah, they did. But they we did. also know that technically they're better. Why are they, as Darren says, several, it feels like they're several levels above? Well, they have put an emphasis on a passing game uh, for longer than we have. It, you, you see this. Look, you know, we dominated... Um, if you go back half a century and, you know, before that, before the Hungry game, uh, it, it, you know, we were physically strong. We played this style of football that, you know, we, we, we battered teams. We, we, you know, yeah. it, but, but then that's the part of the game that everyone can catch up with. Then, once everyone is as physically strong as you and as athletic as you and, 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 and can, play, can play with as much energy as you, it then comes down to, now, who's best at football? And we've neglected that side of the game for too long. So we keep playing teams that have got players to which there is no, of which there is no equal in English football. Thiago Alcantara last night, um, Luka Modric. You know, we haven't got that player. And Jordan Henderson has, has punched well above his weight uh, last, last year at Liverpool. He was one of the players of the season, without a shadow of a doubt. And he really tried to stretch his game to, 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 you know, to expand his game, to expand his repertoire of passing. And, and, he, and, and that's been really good. But ultimately, when he comes up against a, you know, a, a guy like Modric, it, he can't compete at that level. He, cannot, he, hasn't got that, he hasn't got that range. And he can't dictate the tempo of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and we have neglected those sort of players for too long. Um, and that's why we're playing catch up with the rest of the world. By the way, the same thing was going to happen with the women's football team. Exactly the same thing. We were making great progress in in, in, in tournaments because we were we were very very physical and we were very very strong. But eventually, the same thing will happen in women's football. Everyone will have that, and it will come back to technique again. Mm -hmm. Which is why what Phil Neville is trying to do with the, with the England women's team is get the technical level um, to, to to the same as the, uh, the other countries. The, the, other, the other thing, of course, is that any, any national team, by definition, is just the very top end of, of a far, far bigger picture. You know, it's, it, we're talking about how, what is it that England are trying to do, how is it that England can play in this way. Well, in a way, it's not just about what you're doing at, at international level, although, of course, Southgate's attempt to get them to play, and he was saying yesterday that there are times when teams press us 
and it's very difficult to get through that press, so what do you do? Well, mm. one way through it is to just hoof the ball long, but he doesn't want to do that with the mm. risks that, that that implies. And obviously we talk about bravery when a, when, a, kind of when a player plays on with blood pouring out their head, but actually bravery in a way is taking those kind of decisions, knowing that it's risky, knowing that it can go wrong and keep pushing through. But then below that, it's about the way you develop kids. It's about the, the footballing mm. culture as well, because it's not always a project. You know, one of the things that I think has, has made Spanish kids play the way they do is that for years and years and years, the, the, the way that Spanish kids played football was to play five-a-side football on concrete pitches with a ball that doesn't bounce. So it's much more about touch and technique. You have far more possession of the ball. You have far more contact with the ball. And the way we play is different. You, by definition, you play differently if you're playing on a little concrete pitch than if you're playing on a grass field and, and you know, you're pumping up to the guy at the top of the pitch who's really, really quick. And so, so it, it's not just about how you kind of in structural terms build you footballers. It's about how your culture embraces you footballers, about how you as a, as a, as a country play. And that's not always a decision. Sometimes it just kind of happens. Mm. Mm. And yet Argentina, strangely enough, play on full side. The, the, thing, that, the thing that Gareth Southgate and many others fought so hard against, which is playing 11 aside football on a, on a full size pitch from about the age of uh, 11, from the age of 11. That's what happens in Argentina. Although they're collapsing now. Yeah, I know. Uh, at I youth know. level, they're not developing. But they haven't done bad to hit. Yeah. 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 South American sides. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does it? What um, positive sides? Like you, you're, you're a bit more enthusiastic about the performance of, of the side against Spain last night. What, what were the, the main positive aspects that you could draw from that? That well, game last night. well, Gomez, I thought, did OK. OK, people will point to um, his culpability on one of the goals. Um, I thought that in the last 25 minutes, there was a confidence about the way uh, England rallied against the Spanish finish very strongly. Um, I talked already about the, the, the build-up to that first goal. And also the confidence within the players. The players all play at clubs where there is an emphasis on a passing game. Um, and they're, they're under managers who are trying to, you talk about the culture of, of, of passing the ball and, 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 and playing around players who have that ingrained in them and those players will go back to clubs where they'll continue their education as far as that's concerned. So although obviously outside of the setup you know there'll be a lot of uh, negativity and pessimism I think those players are confident about the, the, the direction that they're going in and I think Southgate is absolutely right to send the message from the top loud and clear we are going to continue to go along this listen what we always do we're doing it in the Premier League at the moment very soon very shortly and we start to panic we see with Arsenal trying to impose a passing game oh my goodness what is he doing you know but, our culture is all about being direct and, and being physical and being uh, uh, not really having the patience to, to witness an evolution. And I think as far as Southgate is concerned, he's trying to evolve the team. We're a patient bunch, don't we? Mm, I don't know. Well, you are. You're a patient. You're, patient. A, you're a patient. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much a question of patience. It's, it's basically that there's nothing you can do about it. Anyway, that, that's, the actual, that's the actual problem. We can all see that what the man is trying to do is the way to go. It's it's what I would say everybody around this table and any if you could have got any four guys in today and they would all be f people who have said, well, we've got to try to go in this direction. We've got to try and go in this direction. So now we're trying to go in this direction, but it's become quite obvious quite quickly that we are lacking certain key components to go in that direction. And until that player arrives, until those players arrive, it's going to be very difficult. And it's going to be a case where we play against a team like Spain and we are trying to play a similar style of football to Spain, but without the two or three players that are the key to Spain, mm -hmm. without the one or two players that are the key to Croatia, without the one or two players that are the key to Belgium. It's hard. It's hard to do what Gareth is trying to do. Yeah. It really is, because he, he hasn't actually got the raw materials. Is, is the future of Spanish football secure? Did they, build, did they build a big enough and a wide enough base at youth level to continue, for the production line to continue beyond... Yeah, you know, we can yeah. look back on the great yeah. 08, 10, 12 teams, of course we can, but whether two, 2018 World Cup was an anomaly, we'll, we'll discover in the next tournament. Mm. But 
did they build a wide enough base? Did, is that did, and did strategically is that what they were trying to do? Well, the, 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 there's, there's a whole series of elements that kind of play into it. Um, one of them, obviously, is the way that they conceptualise football, the way that they want to play it, and that is still um, developing players. There are still players coming through, and there is, I think, a natural, um, well, a natural, a, a produced quality with the ball when players make it into the first team that, that perhaps isn't always there in England and obviously with time maybe will be. Um, th there's a whole series of other elements though and obviously there's the fact that for example the big, um, the big clubs they have the B teams playing in what's effectively Spain's third division so they are getting what's, what it can be described as competitive experience against senior teams much younger and then that's the stepping stone into the first team. There's also the, the, the fact that there's a belief in this style of play but curiously enough that's a belief that was obviously ingrained by winning three tournaments in a row it's quite easily forgotten it's now three in a row where they failed it's now three in a row where they haven't won a single knockout game and they've been genuinely pretty terrible in each case you can look at a key moment and think well if that had happened differently then the whole tournament might have been different um, but that for the first time I think has created a debate in Spain where they're starting to say actually were we wrong was this conviction about the way we play perhaps misplaced and one of the things that's been interesting about this particular Spain squad is Luis Enrique has been brought in and there have been those arguing for effectively a, a new policy that breaks away from what we all came to know as tiki-taka and others saying no the problem was that we weren't doing tiki-taka right and after yesterday's game where they kept possession really well where they moved it really well but there were also moments of being more direct being more aggressive yeah. and Saul Niguez is a great example of that hybrid player and you've got the two sides of the debate saying that yes they proved them right this proved we just had to go back to what we used to do. Yeah. No, no, this proved we had to break from what we did. Mm. And, and I suppose, in a way, the problem is that we, we lose sight of those nuances and that this is, broadly speaking, though, still the same footballing culture. Yeah. Let, let's play Mar one of Martin's favourite games, which is um, who, who in the England side gets in, gets in Spain's <laughs> eleven? Who would they take from us? Who would they take from us? Harry Kane. Um, do you want anybody? Yeah, I think, I think Spain would take Harry Kane. Harry I, Kane. I think that's certainly true. Mm. Um, would he start? Yeah. Yeah. Although, actually, this again, this comes into that debate that Sp the Spanish are having is, does a number nine really work for Spain? Mm. Um, and, and obviously, Kane is a lot more than that, and I, and I think it would be unfair to, to narrow him down as a, as a classic number nine. But this debate is ongoing partly because Costa didn't really fit. No one mm. doubts that Costa's a great yeah, player. Yeah, but the true. question is, is Costa a great player mm. for a team that wants the ball, for a team that's denied space, when Costa yeah. is that guy who fights the full, fights the, the centre back and goes yeah. into the space beyond. Spain don't have that space yeah. as a product of the way they play. So Kane would go in, but given the kind of mobility and movement and short space game that they want, even he's a doubt because of the style, not because of the lack of quality, because he's yeah, a okay. wonderful player. I think Trippier would have a chance as well. Yeah. I mean, Possibly. Yeah, I think Trippier would have a chance in any team. And actually right now, Spain are weak at centre back, so I think John Stones or, yeah. would, would... Yeah, and I think would John Stones would, yeah. Mm. But I, I think <laughs> I said Harry Kane already. You enjoy yeah. it too. I was, I was, I was first <laughs> yeah. in with Harry Kane. Yeah. Yeah. How, I think how, how did Marcus Rashford play last night? I thought he did well. I think there was a lot of pressure on him. Um, and um, the, listen, the finish for the first goal, great. Missed a couple of big chances that would have really mm. given him a lot of confidence. Obviously, he wants to play. Okay, top maybe. striker. Does he, does he take those chances? He's in. Yes. He's put himself in the position. He's put himself in the position to strike. But should he have taken them? You say yes. There are a couple. I, I say yes, he should, have, he should have taken them. There's one particular chance where he hits it straight at the keeper straight on either the side of him yeah, and unfortunately. he scores. Late on, OK, he's flagged off for offside, but he's still got to stick it away. And at this level, you know, you don't get that many chances. So when you do get them, you have to take them. And obviously, for what he is trying to prove about himself, um, he's got to be taken at. Mm. You've got Jose Mourinho sitting in the stand. He's probably nudging Ita to Karenka. He spent most of the time texting away, didn't he? Yeah. I don't know what he's playing. Yeah, I, th I thought I, I thought uh, I thought Marcus Rashford did, did did well, but with the same with the same qualifications as, as as Darren has made, that there were a couple of chances that you would have liked to see put away. Um, he was a lively of England's strikers last night. I, yeah. I completely take Sid's point about and Darren's point about Harry Kane and Spain, um, but that's over body of work rather than, say, last night's performance where Marcus Rashford looked the bigger goal threat. Now, whether that was the plan all, all along and that you, you've got Harry Kane and he's going to take two guys away with him a lot of the time and that will give Marcus Rashford more space. Um, 
But we haven't got the options. I mean, you, you've got to, you know, it's, we can have a wonderful big debate about whether Marcus Rashford's a, you know, a striker or, or not, you know, a, 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 a prolific goal scorer or not. But tell, tell me who else we got. Because mm. at the moment it's Danny Welbeck or, the, or a promoted midfield player. You know, because Jamie well, Vardy's now with Jamie. Oh, we'll beg him, yeah. You know, that, we, we haven't got... A, a little while ago we were talking about, oh, we've got all these strikers. We've now got three. Um, unless, you, unless you're talking about, you know, Raheem and, and, and guys like that who are pretty much attacking midfield players. But the, the, that again speaks to that thing about <laughs> the, 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 the Spanish structure, though, in, in that maybe, maybe you don't necessarily need a striker as such. It depends how you build that forward line, what mm. kind of role you want to play. And obviously... Raheem Sterling can play in that position. Whether he's a striker, striker, I suppose, depends on how strictly we're defining that. He's got two goals. Yeah. He? He's, well, that's it. That's again, you know, so, so how, I mean, how are you define that? Are we defining that by someone who who scores or someone who plays a role from that position? Yeah. yeah. But then he scored 23 goals for Manchester City last mm. season, so he does know where the goal is. Mm. But I think what the, the point you're making about um, Rashford and, and the lack of depth, it kind of lends itself to the idea of the decisions that some of the young players are making. Some are going abroad to play more regular first-team football. Absolutely. But, you know, Ruben Loftus-Cheek looks to be marooned at Chelsea. You know, he is a player who obviously made a positive impression at the World Cup. Should he not be somewhere playing regular first-team football, you know? Uh, I think if we do have players who are getting that regular first team football, then obviously that increases the options available to the England yeah, manager. Sure. And that, that's partly a product, isn't it, of the of the economic strength of the Premier League? There isn't the the, the need for players to leave as there as there would be elsewhere. And look mm. at the, the French World Cup winning side. Look how many French players there are playing across Europe's biggest leagues. Mm -hmm. And the, so the the opportunity is there, and not just the opportunity, but that kind of cross fertilisation of style, um, of of understanding different ways of playing the game, was, which is really quite beneficial. And we probably with the exception of the Italians, the big footballing nation in Europe that, that sends the fewest players abroad. Mm -hmm. And then it's really interesting, actually, this, this sudden development of young players going, going abroad. And it'd be, I mean, obviously, it's not by definition, it's not the kind of the, the solution to everything. But it'd be interesting to see how much of a positive impact it, it could have on English football to, to, for players to finally go. Yeah, well, if sure. you look at the World Cup, the, um, there's only two countries at the World Cup where every single player. Um, plays in the domestic mm. league, and one was England and the other was Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, and Croatia and I think Belgium were two of the countries, uh, certainly, maybe not Belgium, but Croatia, I think, were one of three countries where nobody played in mm. the domestic league. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you look at the success of, uh, of Croatia and, mm. and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's a valid point that you need, you maybe need that that influence and that experience. Yeah, sure, OK. Well, England's certainly looking at uh, options. One of them uh, is this man, Sam Wallace, has written about him this morning. That's Declan Rice, West Ham defender who's played for the Republic of Ireland. Could he play for England, though? More on that coming up. Welcome back. OK, let's uh, talk the interesting subject now of um, international footballers and their allegiances, their emotional attachment to countries and the bond. Declan Rice, um, one subject um, at the moment, played for the Republic of Ireland, Darren. Um, and, of course, he does qualify to play for the England national team as well. Uh, much debate, about, he's provoked much debate about this because he's, of course, not involved in the Ireland squad um, at the moment. He's withdrawn for the time being while he makes his decision. Um, what are your views on... Let's, let's take the, the Declan Rice situation in isolation. We'll broaden it out to the attachment and um, what qualifies players... or what should qualify players to play international football. But the Declan Rice situation, let's talk about... Let's, let's keep it to that for now. What are your views on a player who's already played for a country, now considering revert or, or playing for England? I feel for him, uh, because he's in a difficult situation. Uh, the Republic of Ireland obviously need him. Um, uh, given the state that they're in at the moment. Um, England obviously have made contact with him. Uh, he's had players suggesting that, um, that they'd rather not have him if he needs to take the time to think about joining uh, w which club he should be playing for. Or country. Uh, oh, sorry, which country, forgive me. Um, but he's a young player, um, and when you're very young and you play for the lower age groups, obviously you just play, you know. But when you get to a position where you can make a choice about the country for whom you want to play. Um, there are commercial considerations as well as whether or not you will get into the team, whether or not you'll make a contribution at all. Um, would the quality available to, to, to England? Um, there are many players who have been in this situation before. 
have chosen England and not really got anywhere near the first team. And so uh, you could understand why for him it is a difficult situation. Um, personally, I think he should take all the time he needs until he make, uh, to make a decision, regardless of what the ex-pros might well think. Um, and there is a consideration in this. David Walsh has done a piece uh, and today, and he, and, and he says, you know, when you look at the Ozil situation, um, uh, Ilke Gunnigan's brother um, wrote a piece mm -hmm. saying that the fact that people have many identities and loyalties to different groups, uh, so it, it's wrong to reduce a person to a singular affiliation. Now, I know the guys will argue he's English, full stop, you know, but. I think as far as he's concerned, I think it's a bit deeper than that. When you said the commercial consideration, Dan, what did, what did you mean by that? Well, there's a higher profile, obviously. Um, it can be argued. Um, the, committing yourself to the England team, uh, some would say, then, then obviously playing for other, country, other home nations. And I think as far as um, uh, he is concerned, maybe that is something that is in his mind. Um, and I think it's difficult. I've got to, I've got to say, though, and that would be a sad day, wouldn't it, in, in his household, if that's the case? It, 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 there is a coldness about the way footballers think, and I think we discussed this before the show. Um, there are hard... Uh, we may think it's all about the heart, but I think as far as players are concerned, it's what's best for them. Heart or cash? If... International football is dying. Um, you know, th this tournament, the UEFA Nations League, is an attempt to make it more relevant uh, by introducing competitive fixtures where previously there were friendly fixtures. The expansion of the World Cup will kill the, uh, a lot of the drama of World Cup qualification. The, 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 a lot of the drama of uh, European Championship qualification is already dead, because if you can't get there now, I mean, you really do need kicking. Um, and so international football is increasingly becoming irrelevant. Um, and the way to guarantee it becomes irrelevant, absolutely guarantee it becomes irrelevant, uh, irrelevant, is to turn it into an extension of club football, where you choose your country, mm. as opposed to mm. this, is, this is your country and this is who you play for. And I do think there should, it should, it should be, I do think there should be an age Cut off where you you pick your country and this is this is your country and I realise that there's a movement of labour and I realise that people qualify a lot of people qualify for different countries. It it, it shouldn't be beyond the realms of uh, of possibility to actually say look, but for the integrity of international football, it has got to be the best of ours against the best of yours and nationality has got to mean something again it's not something you, that you select from a catalogue who am i going to be where are my best commercial opportunities um where you know where's there a good left back that that might keep me out of the team it shouldn't be about that because that's what turns people off international football the, the, the minute it becomes like just picking your club well then who cares and you're seeing things like victor moses Retiring at the age of 27 because he was English through the age groups, then he was Nigerian, and ultimately, it, it all becomes it all becomes quite wishy-washy. It's a problem, Martin, at the moment. It's past as far as that's concerned. I mean, with, there have been so many cases of of people doing exactly what you just described there. That you know, Declan Rice is just the latest player to find himself in that situation. Well, this is partly caused by the fact that Ireland are, are looking early and earlier to take anyone that has got Irish connections. You know, Declan Rice is, in, is born in England and his parents are English as well. Just because well. you call Declan doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that, that, that Ireland have got first dibs. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I've got no sympathy for Ireland in this because they're, they're, getting, they're getting kids in, basically, you know, they're getting kids in at an age before they've had a chance to consider all of their options. So I'm not saying you, you, you're tied to a country at the age of 12, mm. but I do think there has got to be... Uh, you know, it is not... I feel very sorry for a guy that, you know, plays for, plays for England and suddenly finds he can't get in the team. But it is not everyone's inalienable right to go to a World Cup. It, it shouldn't mean that just because you can't get in one team, you can suddenly switch to another one at the age of 24 because you are, it's your right to play in a World Cup. It's not. It's meant to be about 
excellence. It's meant to be about qualifying for the team. And if you can't get in the team, you can't get in the team. Tough. Not everyone gets to go to a World Cup. But of course, it's natural that within the parameters of the system as it stands, that, that, that people are going to that's take the those system. decisions. So it's the and system that's exactly. Wrong. It comes back to the, 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 the question of, you know, in, in this case, is he entitled to think about this? Absolutely, he's entitled yeah, to think about it. Yeah. Equally, as you say, if, if international football has to be about identification, well, genuinely, in his case, obviously, I don't know his personal case, but in the case of many players, there is genuinely a, a double identification or even a, a tri triple, triple mm. identification with, with national teams. Ivan Rakitic, World Cup semi finalist, is, is a good example. Mm. His parents moved to Switzerland. Mm. He plays for Switzerland all the way through youth level. But his dad, every time he watches a World Cup, is, is talking about Croatia. His dad, you know, in 98 is a huge moment for the family, at least the way that he tells the story. And there is a point at which he makes that decision. And he says, makes that decision with his heart. Other players, I think it's natural, particularly those players who maybe don't feel a, a, an enormous kind of patriotic pull for either of their countries. Well, I am, I mean, take for example, you, you know, I know, the kid who grows up in Spain with, with English parents, I am English and Spanish. Who am I going to play for? Well, in a way, it's just kind of, well, who turns up? Who gives me the opportunity? Who mm. calls me? And I, and I think it's natural that those kids would then, once they're within that team, identify with it. The question is where you put the cutoff point. At what point do you say, make it? That, all of that's fine. But at some point, it's got to be make your mind up time, yes. and yeah. it devalues international competition if you've got guys making switches in their early 20s, yeah. in their late 20s I, I also think you know. I also think there is, I mean, in, in a way it's difficult for me to, to, to rationalise this beyond just a kind of a sense of, of what feels right. But I also think there's a significant difference for, between um, taking someone and putting them in your national team who has grown up in your country and therefore has got a passport in this case, an English passport because they've grown up in Britain and therefore compete for, for, for England. And between a player who comes to England already a professional and then you effectively nationalise him. This is, I mean obviously the paradigm in Spain with this is Diego Costa, who comes to Spain very young, it's true, but is a Brazilian, plays twice for Brazil, mm. but those two games for Brazil are, are not competitive and so you can nationalise him. And it's, it's not a nationalisation process because this is someone who wants to be Spanish, mm. it's a, this is someone who becomes Spanish because he wants to be a footballer and with the national team. And, I think it's entirely natural that players take these decisions, and mm. I think it's entirely respectable, but obviously you then have to make a decision. I must admit, I don't know where the answer lies. Well, well, the, I don't know where uh, I would draw well, the line. The, the Spanish public and also the, um, the players, were they comfortable with the decision Costa made? And I'd like to go back to, mm. to the 2008 European Championship yeah. winning side of, of Marcos Senna as well. Were people comfortable with, the, uh, with this idea? Well, I think, I think when Senna, and there were two at the time, there was Marcos Senna, and then just before that they'd had Mariano Pernia, who was a, an Argentinian left-back. Um, and, and this was a case of, here's a player, he's eligible because he's in Spain for long enough, let's go and give him a passport. Senna, I think there was a, a slight discomfort, maybe, but it wasn't, there was no big outcry, there was no big debate. And then, of course, what happened is he went so to the European no Championships and he played brilliantly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, genuinely yeah. think that the best player at the European Championships in 2008 I was always Brazilian. associate... Mm. I always associate the, the 08 team with Marcus Sennett. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and of course, it's, it's this kind of curious thing where you look at it and you think the European champion, the best player for the European champions is from South America. Um, and, and obviously the, the other example that, that kind of fits this model even more clearly is, is Munir, who was a young kid coming up at Barcelona, scored for Barcelona at 18, the youngest ever player to score for them apart from Messi and Bojan, um, played for the Sp Spanish youth system all the way through, Moroccan, Moroccan parents, but born in just outside Madrid. Play for Spain 13 minutes in a, Europe, in, in a qualifier against Macedonia. This summer appealed to FIFA to allow him to play for Morocco because there's this opportunity to go to the World Cup with his parents' country. Now, I don't, Let him go. I don't doubt for a minute. <laughs> I mean, it's not school <laughs> but I feel for him. Everyone doesn't get a but, prize. But exactly, but I feel for him because I have no doubt that, that here's a World Cup opportunity for a country that I'm sure he identifies with. And bear in mind another thing that I think it's we not sometimes like forget. Win it. <laughs> Decisions are made so, so young. That's the other thing. These are kids. Yeah. You know, you, you're a kid, you come through. In his case, he gets called up for Spain. Del Bosque himself says, I feel bad that we denied him the chance to play at the World Cup with Morocco because we called him up at that stage because he was with the under-21s. There was an injury in the first team squad. They brought him up 13 minutes, prevented from that. He's 18 at that stage. Can he really make a kind of mm. long-term decision? But if you see what I mean, Sid, he didn't... Del Bosque did not prevent him playing for Morocco. He gave him the opportunity so to play for Spain. To play for Spain. Now, if it there turned is, out he isn't quite good enough to play for Spain, that's unfortunate, but it's, it's not some dreadful no, no, wrong that Del Bosque is... There's, 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 there's a small caveat there as well, though, which is that there was a sense now, obviously, 
you know, there'll be people at the Federation who will disagree with me and perhaps not be very pleased that I've suggested this, but there was a sense for a lot of people that one of the things that Spain did was, he's going to be really good, let's get him in now and lock him, and in, lock him in, which yeah. perhaps is unfair, because you're, you're effectively, you effectively are denying yeah. him that opportunity if you take it with that degree of consciousness. Mm. And as mm. I say, there'll be people in the Federation that will tell me that's not the case. But uh, fact, we've, seen this sort of, we've seen this sort of fight over players like Jack Grealish, well, Zaha now is a big, obviously, big miss uh, for uh, the English national team, but he obviously would have taken the view that, <laughs> would I play? Did I play? You know, and, and, and playing for the Ivory Coast, he gets far more opportunity, plays in their first team. Um, he was born in the Ivory Coast. Yeah, but, but the, the, the fact, as far as he is concerned, is that if they are interested in taking him, what do you do if you're a, a Munir and you're in, you've got the face with the uh, choice of playing for Morocco or for Spain? But Munir know? was born in Spain. Uh, Wilfred Zaha was born in the, Ivory, uh, in the Ivory Coast. You could argue that this is, this is how it should be. The, the player that was born in the Ivory Coast plays for the Ivory Coast. The, the guy that was born in Spain, Spain plays for Spain. It is unfortunate that he that he can't get in the team now, but that's all it is. It's a selection issue. It's not a, it's not a terrible wrong. That's what I don't. That's what I don't see. It's not a terrible wrong that has been, um, you know, created against against this guy. It's just equally, it's a selection I, issue. Equally, it's probably worth adding. It nor is it a terrible wrong for any player to have doubts about that. Of for course. any player to to believe that mm. a that they that they identify with more than one nation because they clearly can, that maybe they don't really identify with any, maybe they don't feel that patriotic pull, and that they're thinking, I want to play football, I want to go to the World Cup. Yeah. And that, that's a, a really simple and, and, I think, entirely rational mentality I, I, I to have. What's the, what's the elig eligibility criteria for you? The purist says, as Martin says, you're born in London, you're born... Where... I, I, honestly, Neil, I don't think that. Raheem Sterling wasn't born in England. No, I'm saying Raheem the, I'm just Sterling is English, as English as... No, English I'm just giving an example of the purists. Not, not that you are a no, purist, I'm saying the purists would say, say you, really you're born that. in London, you play for, you play for England. You're born mm. in Abidjan, you play for the Ivory Coast. Mm. It's as simple as that. That's the purists. But we also have to accept it's a cosmopolitan world, people move. People yeah. move countries. Well, living is, so, so what is our so what is our eligib eligibility criteria? The horse is bolted. I don't, you know, I, I think that we'd, we'd, that actually, when we spoke about this, we agree. Actually, it should be if you're from a country, you play for that country. If you are down to the manager, we should have oh, it. Yeah. That year. Mean, you know, they I, are I, the I, rules I, of international football. You know football. what I think about? We've all believed that. that. But I think at the moment, that horse has bolted. You know, we have got lots of different countries taking advantage of the rules to be able to recruit lots of different players. But surely, Darren, you can correct that. If you've got a rule that is, is to the detriment of international sport, now, there's a lot of stuff that is going on to the detriment of, of international competition because the, the minute you start... The minute you begin diluting international competition, it becomes irrelevant because you might as well follow clubs, and it's you know, you know, you might as well you know not not have a hundred metres race to do with nationalities. You might as well all put a vest on with a number and sprint at the end of it, and we'll we'll cheer the winner. In, in, and it doesn't matter where they come from. In fairness, from. I suppose it probably is worth saying, isn't it, that, that we're not actually at that point. It's not that the England team can go and sign fifteen Brazilians and, no, and put them in. I mean, not. we're not we're not at that point. It's still it's still a response to a to if you like a kind of a an in, international mechanism that goes well beyond football and it's not really football's place to be presumptuous enough to say well we know better what nationality yeah. is than the nations that supply passports or the nations that allow mm. uh, allow citizenship and, and so on yeah sure okay good stuff i'm sure this conversation this debate will run and run okay next up we're going to go back to the premier league we're going to talk about manuel pellegrini four defeats on the spin as west ham manager needs a result next weekend more on him next Welcome back with us this morning, Martin Samuel, Darren Lewis and Sid Lowe. Let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning. The front page of The Observer, their sports section, uh, Kane's Fury accuses the referee of bottling it last night at Wembley Stadium, England's 2-1 defeat against Spain. But Danny Welbeck thought he had scored the equaliser in the final few seconds, the Sunday Times this morning. Their verdict, though, it's a bumpy landing. Three defeats on the spin now for Gareth Southgate's England side World Cup semi-final, third and fourth place playoff with Belgium and now Spain at Wembley in the, in the Nations League. Uh, Shaw's agony, good news for him, though, after being stretched off last night. Um, 
He, is, he has been uh, tweeting he's going to make a full and speedy recovery after being stretched off. A couple of other stories, though, Zinedine Zidane, top of United's uh, wish list, according to John Richardson this morning. He's already compiling a list of targets if he succeeds Jose Mourinho. Mourinho was at Wembley last night to watch some of his players in action in international football. Sam Wallace's column, um, why it's wrong to pillory Declan Rice, the West Ham defender, um, who could turn his back on the Republic of Ireland to play for the country of his birth. That country, of course, is England and the Mail on Sunday. Uh, they've got some different ideas this morning. The wrong one, uh, Pep is the right man for Manchester United. Uh, that's Eric Cantona talking this morning to the Mail on Sunday. But I'd like to talk to you because you've got experience of Manuel Pellegrini, yeah. of course, um, in Spain um, when he was manager briefly of Real Madrid, of course, at Malaga as well. He's having a tough time here as West Ham manager, four defeats in a row in the Premier League. Of course, he did win the Carabao Cup against AFC Wimbledon. But in your experience of, of Pellegrini, uh, what, what does he bring to the table as a manager, as a head coach of a football club? Well, I think, I think he, obviously, his biggest success, I mean, I suppose you could define his biggest success as what happened at Malaga, where he took them to within a few, within a few seconds of a, of a European Cup semi-final. But really, it's what he built at Villarreal. Uh, and he built a team that played very nice football, that everybody in Spain identified with, even those who didn't support them, and that overachieved enormously. Mm -hmm. Within a certain environment, though, with an environment of, of tranquility, with an environment of very, very little pressure in a very small town and with exactly the right kind of players for his style. I think there was always a sense in Spain, and of course this is driven by what happened at Real Madrid when they actually um, achieved a points total record for Real Madrid in the season but were beaten to the league title by Barcelona in the first season that Ronaldo played at Real Madrid. There was always a sense that there was something with Pellegrini's teams that meant they just stopped that little bit short of being you know, really, really outstanding. I always thought that was a little unfair, but there was a, there was an element of that, and I, and I think I think his cachet in Spain obviously came down after the time at Real Madrid. I think that happens to almost everyone who goes to Real Madrid, apart from Zidane, who's who's come out of it fantastically yeah. well. But I, I think he's a respected manager. I think he's a well liked manager. But I think if you asked um, Spanish commentators to to give you a list of the kind of the 10, 15 biggest managers in in Spain over the last 15, 20 years, I don't think that many of them would would include him. When, when when he took the West Ham job in the summer, did you think... Oh, I was surprised. Why have you done that? Did yeah, I, in all honesty, and, and obviously, you know, I say this from, from the outside in terms of an understanding of West Ham, but, but I was surprised that that was the option that he took. I was surprised that he went into an environment which was potentially difficult like that, because, as I say, he's gone into environments where things have been, things have been put in place the way that he likes them. So the Malaga project, for example, with, with the enormous amount of money that they invested in that first season, he had a huge say on the signings, he had a su huge say on the approach, and you can see that in, in signing people like Santi Cazola and Tulalan in, in, in yep. Rud van Nistelrooy and so on. And, and I felt that this felt like an uneasy fit, not least because there was interest from Sevilla, which tells you that you know big Spanish clubs still rate him, still think that he's, he's a good manager. And I was surprised that he took this on because it didn't feel like, not necessarily the wrong club, but a natural environment for him to be coaching in. Mm. See, I, I've got sympathy with, with Pellegrini and West Ham in so much as they've been... I know you're not trying to knock them or anything like that, but West Ham are an ambitious club, and I almost feel like there's a feeling in English football that the big clubs, the heavyweight clubs, have a right to aspire to big things, and the smaller clubs have to stay Absolutely in their right. lane. Yeah. And right. from West Ham's point of view, they wanted an upgrade on not only the, the, the personnel and the manager they had, but the situation that they were in at, the, at that particular point. So they wanted to show a bit of ambition. Let's go for a guy who's got experience of working within a tight budget, a guy who's actually done something in the Premier League, no journeyman guy, mm -hmm. a guy who's going to come in and people are going to respect. Mm -hmm. He is that man. He's come in. And the one thing I would say that could be levelled against him, and I know, Sid, you, you know about his, his demeanour, is maybe he could bring a bit more steel to the role. Yeah. But I think as far as West Ham are concerned, and again, I've got a bit of sympathy with the owners. I know people like to knock the owners, but the fans were unhappy. We saw what happened after the Burnley game, yeah. or during the Burnley during game, the Burnley I said. Game, Absolutely. Yeah. So what do they do in the summer? They go out, they spend money, they break the transfer record fourth, several fourth times. Fourth biggest spend in, of any club in Europe. Exactly. Right? I mean, they go out and they show ambition. They do exactly what fans of Newcastle would love their club mm. to do. And other clubs in the Premier League want their club to do. And then, because it, gets, it starts badly, everyone starts saying, it's a mess, it's this, it's that, and they start having to go. Now, 
I don't think you can call West Ham as being in relegation trouble now as much as you can suggest that Watford are in line to go get into the Champions League next Palace season. Palace sacked a manager four games in last season. But they panicked. They panicked because they gave him the mandate. I was in uh, Singapore that summer. De Boer said, the club have given me uh, a mandate basically to change the way we play. Yeah, and we, 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 <laughs> exactly. we laugh and we Absolutely. raise our eyebrows, but no. effectively they asked him to go down a road and then he was he probably got about well, a couple of miles down the road, and then they said, actually, no, we don't yeah. want to go down. And without this, 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 this comes back a little bit to Southgate, doesn't it? Southgate saying, this is an idea. Exactly. There's times when it doesn't work, but if we're going to believe in it, and if we're going to yeah. do it properly, we've got to push through. We've got to go through the difficult moments and, and, and keep doing it. Now, obviously, they, in the end, the results dictate. We know that. That's, that that's, but as you say, the key word you used there was difficult start. We're a well, month into the season. And this is what I mean about the English culture, you see. We, we panic when, when, we, when we start to go along a road and it looks as though it might be a bit tricky. We panic and we want to go back to the way it was when, you know, sometimes the, that, that evolution takes time. It will be difficult. It will be scary. You will lose matches. I'd if, I'd, if, you, if I was a football manager, I'd love to work for... I'd want Darren as my boss. He's a great guy. He's, he's, on, he's on Relax. Money he's got that like zen thing. Until, until the next day, sacking He's drinking green tea and he's got this zen thing going. It's fantastic. Oh, he's Darren on the green tea. Yeah, Darren on the green tea. It's very nice, actually. Yeah, it's very nice. When did you make the Transition to green tea. About a month ago. <laughs> I'm sure your viewers don't want to know about me. No, they do yeah. actually. Yeah. Why, 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 why have you changed the green Much more healthy. Yeah, yeah. I was drinking far lit too much coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> Switchboard is lit. <laughs> but if you look at if you look at West Ham, um, I, I totally agree with Darren. I've, I've got a lot of sympathy for the owners of West Ham. I mean, last last year everyone was going that spend some money, spend some money. They've gone out. There's only three clubs in the Premier League who've got a manager that has won the Premier League, and West Ham are one of them. Fourth biggest spend in, in, in Europe, 100 million, 100 million quid or, or whatever they've spent, and you know they're trying to change the style of football. David Moyes was it was seen as a safe pair of hands, but they want a little bit more. They want to look up rather than look down, which I think is you know is a, is a great thing for a club to try to do to actually look up. And one of the reasons that Pellegrini would have gone there without a shadow of a doubt is. When West Ham played Bournemouth this season, that would have been the biggest home crowd he had ever played in front of in the Premier League. Because it would be 56, 57,000. Man City didn't have that when, when he was there. So, as a foreign manager, as a, as a West Ham fan, traditional West Ham fan, you look at the new stadium and think, oh, this is terrible, this is not what I grew up with. Pie and mash. Um, but but as, as Manuel Pellegrini walking into that stadium, he's looking around going, Look at this. This, 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 this is a big club. This is a club that wants to be yeah. a big club. It's going to be the. I would. Uh, um, what's Sevilla's capacity? About forty. There you go. 40, so it's yeah. so it's sixteen, seventeen thousand bigger capacity. More, more than Malaga. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know? So he's looking around there with none of the baggage that came with. Oh, this is an Upton Park, and he's looking at this thinking, this is a club that wants to go places. If the chairman is saying you've got hundred million to spend, he's thinking he would not. It would not have occurred to him that they could be bottom of the league with no points after four matches. It I would I've not have been his wildest I imagination. I, I suspect it probably still doesn't occur to him. No. In that even now he'll be th he'll be thinking, <laughs> yeah, despite the I'm going to wake up. We will come. We will. <laughs> yeah. That as well. But we will come through this, and that, that he will believe that there are things mm. things that that can still improve, and, and you know that there's a direction he can take. So long as, of course, he continues to get the the support in this, and it mm. comes back to the De Boer scenario. You can say as a club, we believe in this, and we want to go in this direction. But you need to believe in it sufficiently that when it doesn't start well, you yeah. don't go, you know what, that's the end of this. And, and, and Pellegrini, in that sense, I think, I think he will want reassurances mm. that this isn't going to lead to a, to a, drastic, re, you know, a drastic response to, to how, how poor things have gone so far. And you come back to the investment, the investment as well, I have no doubt at all that in the summer, the conversations with him would have involved them trying to convince him, in part through these investments, in part through listening yeah. to what kind of players you want, the problem always is that it's very easy for a club to be convinced and to talk about what it's going to do at the moment in which they're trying to persuade someone to join them. Mm. Once he's there, then of course that relationship by, by definition immediately changes. But well, yeah, what yeah, they've sure. done, by, by, as well as obviously having those conversations, they've allowed him to bring in Husios, the director of football. Mm. The two of them have been mm. working in tandem to bring players in. Mm. Um, it looks as though they've left a couple of uh, spaces in their squad possibly to bring in free transfers so they could uh, maybe beef up the squad further. And I think, I, I don't think they've brought him in 
for the short term. No, I don't okay. think no, no, that no, I, don't. I think that, I, the I question is any question of Crystal Palace and our opinion. Don't know well. That's the difference. They, sure. well, they, 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 they do pride themselves on being a club that don't like to sack mm -hmm. managers. I think even after Avram Grant, after when, it, when Avram Grant went down, they sacked him at the end of that season, yeah, unceremoniously, but they, yes. <laughs> but they sacked him. But I, I think that, you know, as a club, and and wanting to change the way they do things, they've got to stick with him because you know yeah. his record still, is, is yeah. tremendous. They do need to start getting some results. So four defeats in the Premier League though so far for Manuel Pellegrini, David Sullivan. If you think if you're panicking. About Pellegrini, take a tip from Darren. <laughs> green, green tea. tea. Green tea. That's the answer. Okay. Uh, we're going to chat about to Girona and Barcelona. That game being played in America. Sid's interview uh, with Santi Cazorla as well this week. That's all coming next here on the Sunday Sack. <laughs> Welcome back. Okay, let's talk. Um, as Sid's here, um, he's got the knowledge. Girona against Barcelona. Yep. Um, huge announcement that this game, this La Liga fixture, will be played in the United States in Miami. Um, probably on January the 27th. Yeah, well, that's the weekend of the game, so it could be yeah. any, any day over okay, that weekend. OK, so, it's, so it, could be, it could be played at another time, but that is at the moment, yeah. as things stand, on that date. Um, how did it come about? Why did it come about? And how do the supporters of Girona and Barcelona feel about their team playing a La Liga fixture in the United States? Well, the sad, the sad starting point in all of this is that what the supporters feel is largely irrelevant. And I think that's part of the problem in, in this whole kind of in this whole process. And in fact, beyond this in, in Spanish football in general. Just um, how many Girona, Girona home game average average tenants? They'd be? be getting around about twenty thousand. Um, it is true that significant. That, yeah, I mean, it is true that one of the things that the league has done is is to is to actually deal with this particular question. There's there's, there's a suggestion that they will fly fifteen hundred Girona fans there for free, there and back to the game that those who don't go or can't go will get um, a certain amount of money off their season ticket. They're talking about possibly even as much as 40% off the season ticket. And the other kind of compensation package they're talking about is ensuring that significant numbers of around about four or 5,000 will get tickets for the game between Girona and Barcelona at the Camp Nou. So they, they've become aware that one of the problems they've got is that this denies fans the chance to see their club and design, denies season ticket holders the chance to see their clubs. Um, this has still got to be authorised and this is one of the other issues. I was speaking to the president of the Spanish Federation, Luis Rubiales, the other day and the Federation and the League in Spain are pretty much at war. Rubiales and Tebas, the two presidents, really dislike each other and he said this means nothing. This agreement means absolutely nothing because it has to be authorised by us and they haven't even called us. His phrase was, they've called everyone they need, every, everyone except the people they need to call. They didn't call the clubs, they didn't call the players union, they didn't call the federation, they certainly haven't engaged with any fans mm -hmm. groups. So this could still get blocked, not least because FIFA's perspective on it, and of course by extension the Spanish federation's perspective on this, is that if you take a competitive game to another territory, you are invading that territory. And obviously the US Federation also yeah. needs to give Absolutely. authorization for this. So there's a possibility that this won't happen. And one of the curious things um, that the league did, when, when I interviewed Ruby Alice last week, the president of the Federation, the league were given the right to reply. And among the, among the many things that they said, apart from, you know, no clubs will be obliged to do it, we know um, that we have to manage the fans in this. We know that we have to make sure this is done the right way. One of the things they said is, our agreement with Relevant Sports, the company that are arranging this, does not oblige us to take a game to the US. It obliges us to try. Mm. Now, if ever there's a get-out clause, yeah. I, I think that's mm. it. Now, I suspect that this will eventually happen, but it's, it's not guaranteed yet. How, how does it sit with you, Sid? I must admit, it sits with me very badly indeed. Um, on, on, a, on a principal level. As I say, some of the elements that, that I'm most concerned about they have dealt with, which in, in particular is the fans, and one of the reasons why I'm concerned with that is that I think this is an ongoing thing. As I said before, the fans just don't have a voice. They're just not listened to in anything, and they're completely overridden on all sorts of, th all, all sorts of things. My other question mark I have in this is the integrity of the competition. And the president of the league I actually had, as I say, I had a conversation with him the other day um, by message because of this, this Rubiales interview. It put in blunt terms, he described me as a Puritan because I said, you know, the integrity of the league, you can't take a game out of the league. And, of course, their point is this is one game in 380. Obviously, that is if we believe them that it will end with only yeah. one game and this won't be more. And also, even if it is only one game, that does make an impact. Yeah. I know that this is an exaggeration, but it's an exaggeration that I think is worth making to make the point. Imagine that 
Girona against Barcelona, Girona home game, gets taken to Miami in a stadium with 60,000 people supporting Barcelona on a perfect pitch. That home field adv advantage, in theory at least, is removed. No Imagine that Barcelona win that game 5-0, or even 1-0, doesn't matter, in front of their fans, and they win the league by one point. Imagine that Girona go down by one point. Now, these are two scenarios that probably won't happen, but I think, to counter Tebas' argument, I think in a way you have to be puritanical about this kind of question. Because I think the league itself, and regardless of the, 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 you know, the question about the fans, regardless of the question about the clubs, regardless of the way that you do this, and whether you um, negotiated or, or consulted or not, there has to be a, a fundamental question, which is, is this a league campaign or not? You do this for a cup game, it feels slightly different. You do it in the league, I think it, I think it is significant. At least, if nothing else, in motion it's significant, in terms of the principle of it. How, how will English, English football look very carefully at, at this? Well, there is a... Ex uh, let's call it an experiment. A key element of what... Sid just said was uh, the disdain for the fans uh, because they have not had a say and you would imagine that the English uh, the people with an interest in it that over here in England will be looking very closely mm. at how it develops because there is money to be made in those territories in in, in those countries and I think uh, because of that fact there is every chance that they will try to resurrect what was the 39th game uh, shot down in flames obviously but if it doesn't become a 39th game, if it becomes one of the 38 games and we take it to another country because we can make money, if you guys do that and it happens over here in England, you know, the fans will be the last person, the last voice that they will listen to. And, you know, as, as, as is the case, I think he called it an adventure, Rubiales. An adventure, he? yeah. He's, got, he's gone off on this adventure without, without consulting anyone. I think it's worth pointing out as well here that the fans' voice in Britain, and I, I know we, obviously, we complain about kick-off times, you complain about distances travelled and all sorts of things in England. The fans' voice in England is far more united and far more listened to than it is in Spain. And mm. in, in that sense, the, the fans' position is much stronger. So I think if there was a backlash from fans in England, I think it would carry much more weight than, than, a, back, than a potential backlash in Spain. Is this the product of the modern world and the influence, say, of American sports, Martin? Let's, well, let's say, for example, the it. basketball, basketball comes once a year to the UK. Mm. Um, and at the proliferation of NFL matches. Mm, and we can't get a team out. Mm. And we can't get a team out. So, uh, so uh, basketball coming to England, or coming to Britain, has increased Great Britain basketball, not one iota. You know, we still can't get a team out, we still can't get funding, we still can't get any of these things. This is the... Barcelona will arrive in... Say this takes place. Barcelona will arrive in Miami to a great big fanfare, play a game of football and go home again. That's the point I think, this is, a key, I think this is a key question. I'm not even you, convinced you know, that the impact is lasting. They had... Yeah, absolutely. Barcelona is not lasting at all. Yeah. Barcelona got a fantastic office in Manhattan. Absolutely fantastic office. Who cares? It's, you know, they, they come in. These, the, the international champions trophy or whatever, this... Tournament yeah, like in the summer, out there, the it? summer that America, the, 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 this, this that the Americans have suddenly realised is actually a pre-season friendly, uh, so they're not going in the same numbers as they once were. Uh, you fly in, you play a game, go home again. It's, Manchester City, and I know Man City are part of the Girona thing, mm. and, and so that. But what Man City have done by creating New York City? Now that's something mm. totally different because it's a team with the same colours you know, with a similar name, actually playing in your country, in your main league. Now, if, if something is going to create a, 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 a generation of Manchester City supporters I, I, in America, it's the fact that they've got a sister club based in America. Mm. It's not a fly-by-night visit where mm. you have a game of football and then disappear back to Barcelona, not to be seen again until it's your turn in five years' time or, or, well, that, or whatever. And that, that's, that's also another element from the, from the Spanish point of view. One of the things the league's done, the league actually has done many things really quite well over the last five or six mm. years, financial controls and so on. One of the things they're very keen on is this idea of developing the league as, as as the product itself. This isn't just the place where Madrid and Barcelona happen to play. Mm -hmm. We've got to develop the league as a product. The problem is, of course, that the reality is, is what it is. And so when this deal is done, this deal says, well, it has to be Madrid or Barcelona that go. Mm. And this again speaks to that thing of, of there being certain classes within the league. So, all right, Madrid or Barcelona have to go, but we're not going to take a home game off them. Mm. So automatically, you've already got this, this kind of differential that says, well, tell you what, let's find someone who'll take one of their home games mm. so that we can take their sure. opponents 
which absolutely must be Madrid or Barcelona didn't, there. Didn't the Super Cup, wasn't the Super Cup right. the Morocco? So th th yeah, so this is, this is where um, the, this kind of conflict between Tebas and Rubiales is, is quite difficult to, to, to kind of reconcile because the league is going to take this game to the US and the Federation isn't happy about it. The league's argument, and of course there's certainly entitled to say this, is hang on a minute, you just took the Super Cup, which is, belongs to the Federation, not the league, mm. to Morocco. Now, the Federation's argument to this, which you can choose whether you buy it or not, is that this is a two-legged game, the Super Cup, their version of the Charity Shield. You play home and away. This year, because Barcelona were in the US and because Sevilla had the qualifiers for the Europa, uh, Europa League, which they didn't expect, we didn't have two dates. We had to play it on one date. So we had to find one stadium and we genuinely couldn't find anywhere in Spain. This is what they say. So we took it to Tangiers. Just across the water. Oh, if you, I mean, if you live in Tarifa, if you live in Tarifa, Tarifa it's fine. It's just a boat trip across the straits. And of course, but, there was a, there was a there was nightmare with all of the fans not being able to get in. And yeah, it was and, and it was it, it didn't work nightmare. particularly well. Their justification is that we were put in a difficult position and we had to find a solution. Mm. But this is not they, their argument. Is this is not the same as taking the league game there? The Super Cup in Italy has has gone around the yeah. world for a number of years mm. now. I mean, and you see, and you could argue, you could you could argue if we're so desperate to play. You don't mind I, the you don't mind I, the Community I, Shield because you don't do it. Do you? I don't do it. I don't do it. No. So let's take that. I don't do it. It's a friendly, but but the um, it's not it's not so much now to be fair. But um, but you could take the community shield abroad because there's yeah. no great love for it in this country. Mm. There really isn't. I mean, mm. and you could you could do that if you wanted to take a a, a prestige mm. game to promote the English game. I'm not quite sure we need to promote the English. You know, it's it's you know, it's a bit like AIDS awareness, really. I mean, we're pretty aware of it now. I mean, you know, there, there came a time when AIDS awareness stopped being a thing because everyone is aware of it. Everyone, you know, the charities were were, were, were well supported. But, but, but Martin, you know? that, that that's the point. It would not be to raise the profile of the game. It would be about money. It would just be to get some one-off money. Yeah. That'd make a change, wouldn't it? Yeah. There you go. That's a okay. Um, delightful thought. Yeah. I did promise we are going to talk uh, about Santi Gazzola. Uh, we are going to talk about it um, in the next part. Sid's here, did an interview with him in the week. We'll talk more about that next. OK, the boys love their chat about Girona against Barcelona. So much that we had to save Santi Gazzola for this part, Sid. But you've sat down with him. Of course, I'd like to talk about him because he is an Arsenal yeah. favourite. Um, Arsenal fans worshipped him. They loved the way that he played the game, his attitudes. And, of course, he had a horrendous run of injuries um, but now he's resurrected his career he's yeah. revived his career just tell us about how, his mood how he's feeling and his thoughts towards his career in English football with our, his, uh, at of course, with us. Well, I mean, obviously, the, the main thing is that the sadness with the way that it ended, that it ended almost without even the chance to say goodbye mm -hmm. because his last game was Luther Goretz in, in October 2016. At the time, there was a sensation that, well, this won't be an important injury, and, you know, two years on, and he wasn't able to return for Arsenal. The way he's feeling now is, is extraordinarily happy to have been able to start the first three games of the season for Villarreal. This isn't charity. I mean, much as Villarreal have supported him, he said that he's extremely grateful for what they've done. He's played because... He's deserved to play because he's been one of their better players. Obviously, there's still the doubt. There's still the slight nervousness uh, on the pitch. There's the fact that the, his body weight is now loaded through one side of his body because the, the, the Achilles tendon is, is obviously not as strong as, as it should be. But the main thing is he's playing. Mm. And, 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 of course, on a very, very basic level, he's delighted with that. Mm. How does he feel about his... his um, career at Arsenal? He was such an important player. He yeah. was such a lovely... He was such a lovely player to watch. I think that the Arsenal fans felt blessed that they had the opportunity. Yeah, and, and I remember, you know, listening to Wenger talk about him at the very start and just saying, you know, this is a guy watching play, and it's just there's there's a joy in watching play. There's there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a fun, it's a fun uh, kind of element to the way that he plays, but also in, incredibly competitive with it. I think his sense now. I was struck by the lack of bitterness. Obviously, there's bewilderment because it's a, a, a confusing injury, which in a way goes all the way back to 2013. There are other elements, in particular, of course, the knee injury in the middle, which is kind of relevant and irrelevant at the same time because it's all part of a, a much longer process. I think there's a, a huge amount of disappointment at, at the way that it ended, that it just kind of drifted away. But uh, I was very struck by how much fondness there still is for Arsenal, how much affection there still is. Um, and, and, you know, 
it's natural, I think, given everything that happened, that there will be moments of anger. It's natural when you listen to the, the, you know, him talking about his leg splitting open, you listen to him talking about the, the infection literally tumbling out in the yellow mm. liquid, the, the, the fact that he's been under the knife ten times, the fact that he basically la lived almost a kind of a, a, a monasterial life in a hotel on his own in, in Salamanca for the best part of a year. All of that stuff would naturally, I think, create some, some anger and resentment. But curiously, the, I'm, I'm struck by how... Well, how much he still looks like Santi, you know, yeah. how, how, how funny he still is, how, how kind of positive he still is about things. And, and, and it's an extraordinary story which tells you something about everything else. You know, you've got this small, technical, talented, um, kind of almost magical sort of player with a big smile on his face. And yet underneath it all, he's as tough as old boots as Yeah, well. he certainly is. Uh, to be playing again, we wish him, of course, well. Good start to his uh, career with Villarreal. Of course, Sid sat down with him earlier in the week. That interview is, uh, you can still access it online. Darren, um, we need to go back to international football. Um, we'll talk England, Switzerland in a moment, but Wales in action um, against Denmark. Good start for them under their new head coach, Brian yeah, Giggs. Terrific first game. Mm. Uh, Giggs couldn't really have hoped for a better start to life as Wales boss and as manager in his own right. Um, I think what look, first win over Republic in 26 years, I think the style of play was impressive, the way they went about their business, the confidence in that midfield, the players they've got available to him, um, Tom Lawrence, Connor Roberts, who scored on the night as well, um, Aaron Ramsey, who, who scored, and Gareth Bale, who is in mm. sensational form, uh, 10 goals in nine games for club and country. Um, and the confidence is there. Uh, and everyone knows how difficult a job um, that that Wales job is when lots of people are of the view that there are maybe a one, two team, sorry, one, two man team. Um, and so it's about getting the sum of the parts to work together. There had been a view that maybe uh, they'd come to the end of a cycle. Gareth Bale could only take them so far, and whatever else. But it does look as though it's reinvigorated them. And um, he was saying afterwards that uh, on their day, they're a match for any team in the world. I think that might be stretching it a bit. Um, but certainly, as far as the confidence and the quality is concerned, they're back up and running again. Yeah, they certainly are. We've been looking for a Wales correspondent on this programme for, <laughs> for a while now. I doubt that. You spoke with such. So articulate, you've so much confidence. Yeah. Green tea, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I recommend that you drink it. It's well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. England, Switzerland. <laughs> England, on, England, Switzerland on Tuesday. It's a friendly at uh, King Power. You fancy it? Oh yeah, I'm there. You're there. I'm there. What um, What does Gareth Southgate do? He's going to make some. He's going to make some changes. Is he's going to give opportunities to, mm. to others here? What What do we want to learn? What do we want to learn from Tuesday? Well, you've got to make massive changes now in the uh, friendly matches. Because what the Nations League um, competition has done, it, it, it's, it, it's made more of your matches competitive. So your substitutions are limited, everything is limited. The, the days of, yeah. oh, right, we're playing Spain, so we'll start with this 11 and then we'll you know, bring seven guys on in the second half, that's gone. You know, you know, it's a competitive match. So the only chance you're going to have to, to look at your wider squad are in the... Oh, in the friendly matches. I, 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 that's why I was amazed that Jamie Vardy's retirement from international football was so sort of readily accepted. I mean, if ever there was a situation where you might have said to him, "Look, Jamie, I'll, you know, I won't start. I'm not starting you against Spain, but I am starting you against Switzerland in front of your own crowd." Let's see how it goes and see how you feel, feel at the end of the match and see if you still want to step back from playing for England. But anyway, that that, that that's done. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's going to make changes. But, again, we're coming back to the point right at the very start of the show. Even though it's a, even though it's a friendly match, England do need to win. And I know we can say it's a friendly match and it's the performance or whatever, but we have got to start getting a return from what we're doing yeah. because we can all keep going, oh, yeah, this is the right thing, this is the right thing. But, ultimately, you know, there has to be a means to an end mm. and we have got to start getting a palpable return. Otherwise, people will will begin to wave. Isn't, we'll isn't, isn't the World Cup semi-final a return? I mean, doesn't that doesn't that yeah, give us credit yeah. for, for no, at least it does. a while? You'd, you'd hope, yeah. But yeah. it would still be if if England were to lose to Switzerland, it is the worst losing run in the history mm. of English football. We've never lost four games on the turn before, oh, and no. and you can you know and I'm not saying yeah. we deserve to, to you know go around, I'm not saying that Gareth deserves that round his neck. Let's hope it doesn't. Let's hope it doesn't come that to that, Martin. Um, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, thanks very much for your company this morning. Martin Samuel, Darren Lewis, uh, great debut. Sid Lowe, thanks very much for coming in.